Let's see. Uh, SpaceX is next. Elon Musk. Where's our SpaceX? There he is. All right, I think uh, we're just waiting for the slides to up. Uh, yeah, there we go. That's uh, uh, just a photo of uh, Falcon 9 uh, on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. That, that's a real photo, not, not touched up or anything. Uh, and uh, that, that's the vehicle that uh, will be carrying cargo to the space station. Uh, we'll do our first uh, flight, test flight uh, later this year, uh, carrying our Dragon spacecraft. And then next year, we'll be doing our first flights that actually go to the space station, carrying cargo and bring it back. Um, you know, before I jump into this, one thing I think it's, it's very important for the public to uh, realize is that we're currently uh, on a path to sole source uh, human spaceflight to the Russians. Um, I don't think this is really, uh, people have quite realized this in, in, in the general public, um, <coughs> but, but that's what's going to happen right after the space shuttle uh, retires. We are, we are sole sourced uh, to the Russians and will be so uh, until there is an alternative. Uh, we believe we can eliminate that gap. Um, or substantially reduce it at least. Um, and I think it's, it's be money very well spent uh, to have an American entrant uh, into that race rather than the current social <coughs> situation. Uh, next slide. SpaceX is about seven years old. Uh, the, the primary goal of SpaceX is actually reliability. Um, it's not reduce, reducing cost, although we do reduce cost quite a bit as well. Uh, we're about 800 employees who are growing uh, 50 to 30 percent a year. We're in uh, California, Texas, and, and Florida, primarily. And um, the, really, the, the whole purpose of SpaceX from the beginning has been human spaceflight. That's, that's the, the, the very reason I founded the company and created it. So next slide. Uh, we've been able to get a, a, a lot of customers on board SpaceX. So in addition to NASA and, and the Defense Department, we've gotten uh, Sweden, Malaysia, Canada, uh, a number of commercial uh, providers, all of whom have done technical and financial due diligence on SpaceX and concluded that SpaceX is a wise bet um, and, uh, and uh, put down uh, deposits for long. Next slide. Uh, we reached orbit last year uh, the, the, with Falcon 1. The Falcon 1 is a complete ground up development. So uh, we developed the, the main engine, the upper stage engine, the structures, uh, the avionics. Uh, the launch infrastructure, uh, and launch the, a rocket with cryogenic propellant from a remote tropical island, which is not easy. Uh, so it, it's also important to note that we, there are huge lessons learned in Falcon 1 uh, going to uh, Falcon 9. In fact, much of the same hardware that's in Falcon 1 uh, goes into Falcon 9. Um, and uh, as, as far as the, the engine is concerned, I think there were some questions raised earlier about development of, of engines. Um, uh, there have only been three engines developed in the United States that have seen orbital flight uh, in the last, it, since I think uh, the space shuttle main engine about uh, almost 30 years ago is when it was developed. Uh, one of them was the RS-68, which is used in the, in the Delta IV. The other two are the, the Merlin and Kestrel engines developed uh, by SpaceX, which are hydrocarbon engines. Um, next slide. Here you can see some pictures of Falcon 1 getting prepared for its next flight. It'll be carrying a satellite for Malaysia. Next slide. I'm going to go very quickly through the slides since I only have 20 minutes. Um, uh, we've, we've made su substantial reductions in cost uh, across the board in our engines, structures, avionics, uh, and launch operation. Uh, again, so I'm going to be reemphasizing re this many times. Falcon 9 is designed from the beginning to be a human carrying vessel. Um, uh, it's, uh, has, also has is something which people have taken for granted in. Uh, in airliners, which is engine out capability. So I, I think a lot of people would be uncomfortable getting on an airliner where, with, with one engine. Um, and yet that's part of the course in, in rockets. In fact, in a lot of rockets, it's even worse than that because you may have three engines, and if any one of those fails, the mission fails. Uh, with Falcon 9, we've designed it just in, in a way similar to the Saturn 1 and Saturn 5, uh, which had a fl flawless flight, uh, flight records. Is if you lose an engine, it doesn't matter. You can still complete the mission. 
Uh, next slide. Uh, there's, there's a lot of videos on our website if people are curious. Just go to SpaceX.com and you can see the engine test videos. Uh, this year, uh, SpaceX will manufacture uh, more rocket engines than the rest of U.S. production combined. Uh, in fact, more than any country except Russia. Uh, next year, we expect to exceed Russia. Next slide. Uh, that's the base of Falcon 9. Uh, bears some resemblance to the base of, say, uh, Saturn 1, um, which had eight engines rather than our nine. Uh, some pretty epic uh, uh, engine firing videos. Some very funny videos on YouTube of the, the locals uh, observing the engine firings. Uh, next slide. Uh, some pictures of, of our factory in Hawthorne. You can see our engine production line. Next slide. Uh, here's Falcon 9 uh, going through final qualification. Uh, we expect to be ready to launch Falcon 9 later this year. Um, and uh, if we've, hopefully we'll have the first and second flight stages uh, on the pad by the end of summer. So uh, you, can, you can see pictures of the, the factory and various stages of qualification. Next slide. I'm going to go very quickly. So um, this Falcon, Falcon 9 on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. Next slide. More Cape Canaveral stuff. Next slide. Um, this Dragon, um, that, that's, the, that's a full flight fidelity structural test unit of, of our Dragon spacecraft. Again, our, our, our Dragon spacecraft is designed explicitly to meet the NASA human rating standards. Um, and uh, we're 90% complete on that qualification. It's worth noting that Dragon has five windows, uh, four windows, I should say, um, and you don't need windows for cargo. Yeah, say the obvious. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, Dragon going through uh, structural qualification testing. Uh, the, the two driving load cases for Dragon are the um, uh, worst case abort. So if, you, if the system aborts at the worst case and you have these reentry re loads, you can be coming, coming in at 15 or 16 Gs. Um, so it's designed to meet the, those loads. It's also designed to meet the loads associated with a launch escape tower. Next slide. That's more SpaceX hardware. I, I, I forgot, almost forgot to mention our, our, our Draco engine. That's our in-space engine. So SpaceX actually has a, a third engine, which is used for in-space maneuvering, uh, for primarily for docking and, and orbit translation. Uh, next slide. Uh, more hardware. There's our heat shield on the bottom left. Uh, we developed the Pika X, which is an improved form of Pika in conjunction with NASA Ames. Next slide. Uh, more hardware. Oh, this is uh, the communications unit for communicating between Dragon and the, the space station. Um, and that will be delivered uh, at the end of the month. Uh, it's quite a, quite a tricky thing to do. Also the crew command panel. Next slide. Uh, our Dragon Eye, this is a, a, a LiDAR system that's used to image the space station. As, it appro as Dragon approaches the space station, it's got to figure out relative orientation uh, and the approach vectors and then plot a course to uh, berth with the space station. Um, that's going to get flown on the uh, STS-127, which is currently on the pad. Um, so it'll be tested before we even do our first Dragon mission. Next slide. Uh, we've completed the Space Station Safety Review Panel Phase 1 and most of 2. We expect to finish Phase 3 in er early next year. It's, it's important to appreciate that Dragon is, ha has to, even for cargo, Dragon has to be human rated for the approach to space station, for being at space station, and for leaving space station, because there are people in the space station. Next slide. We've, we've done 14 of the 22 milestones on schedule, all financing rounds, uh, and all uh, uh, design reviews through critical design review. Uh, there have been several ho uh, major hardware milestones also in there. Uh, we, there there's going to be some slips in the uh, remaining milestones, but, but we're talking about slips that are measured in months, not years, which is relatively minor in the space industry. Um, and so we, we're expecting to, to complete all, all of our demonstrations uh, next year, by summer next year. And next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, crew capability is the very reason SpaceX was founded. Um, so we will do whatever we need to do to make this happen. Um, and um, yeah. N next slide. So uh, one of the advantages of 
using the Dragon 4 uh, crew is that it will already have been flown many times with cargo. So you have essentially the same vehicle, the same spacecraft, and the same rocket that it will, will flown many times before you even put people on board. This is a huge uh, uh, risk and re retirement uh, approach. Uh, so it you know, should be pretty safe by the time you, you even want to put people on it. Um, next slide. Um, regarding the factors of safety, again, we're designed to the 1.4 uh, factor safety throughout the vehicle unequivocally. Um, the, the, the ELVs would require some work, at least in some places, to get to the 1.4. The Falcon 9 does not. It was designed from that for the beginning. Um, so, let's see. Yeah. Uh, next slide. So, in terms of what, what is necessary to go from the, the, the cargo dragon to the crew dragon, there's only one major development item, and that is the launch escape system. And that's, that's the driving, that drives the schedule uh, for completion of, of crew capability. Uh, and that is an approximately 24 month uh, development cycle. So, we've already done the preliminary design on that. Uh, we need to complete the design, qualify it, and test it. Uh, so, that, that's, that two years, basically, from, from the moment NASA says go. Uh, it's about two years minimum to, to get that capability working. If you add some margin in there, you add, a, add another sort of six, six to nine months of margin uh, that says, I think, comfortably under three years to get from today to get uh, human capability. Um, so that, that really eliminates the gap from our standpoint. I mean, the, I, I, do, I do agree, by the way, with having both Soyuz flights and uh, Cuts crew flights at the same time. You know, it's planned for the same year because you want to make sure uh, that you, you that, that there's no gap there. So, uh, so I, I do agree with the, the approach of that, that uh, space operations director of NASA has to to purchase Soyuz flights. I would do the same in their position. I just think it makes sense to uh, turn on commercial crew capability and have it planned for that same period of time. Uh, Three hundred million. Uh, we can also do uh, what's called a lifeboat dragon, which is just uh, an emergency escape vehicle. We can do that a lot faster than, than we could do the, uh, the ascent phase because no launch escape system is needed. So we could do the, li the lifeboat dragon in uh, one and a half years, uh, which would improve the capability of the space station uh, because the, our, our dragon uh, crew capsule is capable of carrying seven people rather than the three people for the Soyuz escape vehicle. Uh, next slide. Um, so basically, there's a lot of value that's been delivered for uh, under the COTS program. I mean, if you compare this to almost any other uh, space development program, you say, what did the government get for $278 million? Actually, they haven't even paid $278 million yet, $230 million. Um, this, this is pretty, this would be pretty darn high on the list of highest value for money. So, uh, yeah. All right, next slide. So, uh, yeah, oh, next slide. I think I've probably got like two minutes left. <laughs> I think we've seen this slide. Next slide. <laughs> uh, so, it cuts is really uh, an enabling function for NASA. By having cuts, you know, commercial uh, crew servicing of low Earth orbit activity at uh, an affordable cost, that, is really, that really enables uh, NASA to go beyond low Earth orbit, to go to the moon, to go to Mars, and, and Maybe go to an, as an astronaut, an asteroid. On the other hand, if NASA's budget is uh, has to be dedicated to low Earth orbit servicing, then that's all what NASA can do. Um, and the reality is that NASA is not going to get a, a, a giant budget increase. So it seems like the only way forward, the only way we're going to do exciting things in in human spaceflight is if if commercial companies handle the low Earth orbit stuff and, and NASA focuses on the uh, stuff beyond low Earth orbit. Next slide. And it, that's it. Any questions? Great. Elon, thank you. Other questions? Please. Thank you. On uh, one of your early slides on the Falcon 9, you included the statement that it um, has a greater than five times cost reduction compared to domestic competitors. I, I simply don't understand what, that, what that's trying to tell me. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, sure. That, that's just. Um, if you, if you take the cost of, uh, the average cost of an ELV 
uh, of a sort of ELV, yeah, it, it, we're, and you compare that to our vehicle, uh, it's, it's somewhere around a four or five X difference. So Falcon 9 is about a $40 million cost per flight procured commercially. Um, you know, my understanding is that if you had an equivalent yeah, ELV, uh, you'd be paying closer to 200 million or just below 200 million. Thank you. But, uh, particularly when you factor in the, that the fact there's Air Force infrastructure payments that have to be uh, divided by those flights, mm -hmm. which we do not receive. Mm -hmm. Leroy? Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Congratulations on your success to date. Uh, I had a question on uh, Falcon 9 and Dragon. Assuming uh, COTS D goes forward, uh, do you have a test program identified for Falcon 9 before you'd have confidence to put a, a crew on board? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, how many flights do you, do you envision having to for that test program? Um, well, I think I think we'd want to have at least uh, a dozen flights of, of Falcon 9 before we put crew on board. But that's not going to be a problem because, I mean, we have right now 21 flights on manifest already. Okay, and, and I assume also you'd have a test program for your uh, crew escape system. Yes. And, and would that be part of that test program? Would it actually, uh, would you test that system off of Falcon 9? Uh, yeah, there, there, there are two, two major tests. There's the paddleboard test, which, which we, don't, we would not need the rocket for. Um, that could be done at White Sands or something like that. Um, and then there's a high altitude abort, which is really the same cost as a mission, if not slightly greater. Um, so we'd, we'd want to do both those tests. Okay, and then if, once you uh, get a manned capsule, how many flights do you envision uh, manned flights into orbit before you declare uh, operational capability? Well, w for that, we would consult with NASA. Um, I think that that would be as, as much NASA's call as, if not more, than, than ours. Um, so, but I, I'd figure at least two or three. Um, because there's, there's very little difference between our crew versus cargo version, it's kind of a different situation than many developments before, which have been dedicated to crew or dedicated to cargo. Okay, thanks. I think that's it. Thank you very much. All right, thank Appreciate you.